So welcome everyone to the North Florida Luxury Mastermind. I have my good friend Alex on this call. He is from the Chicago area. I'm going to let him introduce himself in a minute, but I first just want to say thank you so much. Um, I know you just had announced before we started recording that you just closed on your 50th home. That's a lot for, for luxury salespeople. So you're a true real estate consultant. And um, again, we just appreciate you being here and sharing all your knowledge. And we will open it up to Q&A towards the latter part of the call. So I'll monitor the chat if this is your first time on. Um, but please go ahead and introduce yourself, Alex, and let us know who you are. Thank you, Brandy. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Alex Wolking. I am with Keller Williams One Chicago in the good old city of Chicago, Illinois. Um, I uh, am a second generation broker, an SOB, a son of a broker. Yeah. <laughs> Grew up in the business, uh, started working for my dad when I was 12, and then uh, fell in love with the business and uh, started selling real estate when I was 19. And then um, just uh, this year, I was named as uh, 30 under 30 by the National Association of Realtors. So there's Wait, my- Hold, hold on, stop. I need you to repeat that because I knew that, but that's a pretty incredible accomplishment. Yeah. So the National Association of Realtors, 30 under 30, how many people do they pick? Um, so it's only, so it's, they pick 30 out of, I don't know how many hundreds of people, um, apply for it every year, but I'd applied for it every year since I got in the business 10 years ago and they finally, <laughs> finally took me. <laughs> well, congratulations. I know you're a rock star. We've spent so much time on panels and we've gotten to know each other through the luxury division. I know we've had a lot of changes and we now have this earned in ability and I'm, I'm loving it. So let's talk a little bit. Um, one, you had a background in real estate, so that's very clear. But at what point did you decide I'm a luxury agent and, and that's kind of what I'm good at? And how did you get started in that? Yeah, great question. So growing up in the business, my dad loved first time home buyers. He loved, you know, the he loved helping everyday people out. And he never really went for higher end business and it drove me nuts. And it wasn't because of the money. It just, I thought those houses were so much more exciting. They were so much more of a challenge. And, um, you know, I was always asking about it and he's like, well, you're not going to make any money if you focus just on that. I was like, watch me. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I at like 13, I was just like, watch me. Um, but I, I just knew, you know, I, I, I grew up in theater, so I'm very creative in how I think and um, problem solve. And um, I, I, enjoy, I look at marketing real estate as, as an art form, not just a science. And I, but I'm also very scientific, very, um, you know, left-brained, very analytical. Um, so that I was always drawn to larger properties. And the, every time I saw a house that had been on the market for 500 days, I'm always sort of thinking, what's wrong with it? How can I challenge that or change that? So I see I, luxury real estate just really gave me um, a, a creative logistical challenge. And I, so that's what drew me to it. It was just something that made me use my brain. Um, I, so I love I, that. So I took the I took the Institute for Luxury Home Marketing training to get my CLHMS designation in 2012. It's so almost 10 years ago now, um, and I I wanted to take that training. I wanted to learn more about it, um, and that was when I knew that I wanted to start carving out a niche because I did not start in Chicago. I started selling real estate in Iowa, in the Quad Cities area where I'm from. And then I went to school in Chicago. So that's how I, that was my connection. And then in 2016, I moved back to Chicago and started my business all over again from scratch. So and you started it from like nothing. So I nothing. want people to hear that. Like, I want them to hear that story because I have a lot of agents that will move here and they'll start in one of the two market centers that I'm now an OP of. And they'll say, I don't have a database, right? You hear that. I don't know how I'm going to get into luxury. So what I'm hearing from you first and foremost, which just goes back to the good old MREA, no matter what kind of real estate you sell is mindset. You know, yeah. you, you were told you couldn't do something or that you weren't going to be able to make enough money at it. And even as a, a teenager or a preteen, you're like, 
watch me. So it's just having that confidence. You exude confidence. But then secondly, what I'm hearing in the conversation, which is again, very basic, is your learning base. You're a student of the market. And so you're looking at the inventory every single day and saying, how can I do it differently? I love when you talk about not being like super right-brained or left brain. like everyone wants to categorize themselves in this certain way. And we talk about these KPAs, but you're kind of like right in the middle and me being a psych major, I'm like, oh, I love that because you can kind of just understand both sides of it. So I always say surround yourself with someone that might be more creative if you are thinking more logical and vice versa, but it's nice if you can see both perspectives. Absolutely. And, you know, to your point earlier about, um, you know, the, the, the mindset, um, what really got me into is I started, the other funny part of my story was I started going to open houses. My mom would not take me to open houses when I was a teenager. I would beg her and she wouldn't take me. So I would just go on my bike. And, um, and I, it wasn't until I turned 16, I could start, finally start driving to open houses. And then when I started driving, um, going to higher end opens, I would just see how agents would market their properties. And I remember thinking at 16, I was just like, I could do this so much better. (laughs) This is, this is, this is pathetic. They just have an MLS sheet with some pictures on the back. This sucks. Um, And I, I I always had these ideas, but I just, I had no outlet for them. And I don't really look at real estate. Everyone talks about your business, your business, your business. Real estate for me has always been a lifestyle as much as a craft. Like it's something you're always refining. And I think so many, and to your point about being learning based, I knew I, and even to this day, like I always try to do some sort of training or education every year, just because I, and something that's not the same bold or family reunion or mega camp, those are all great, but I always try to do something else that's outside of that. Because I, I, again, I look at real estate as a, as a craft. Um, You're always refining it. I love that you are talking about education because I'm just a super nerd. Everyone knows I'm a data junkie and like, Um, and I I don't even know if I like that term data junkie, but that's what I'm called. And so I'm going to come up with a much more eloquent name for what I like and enjoy, but I just, I love statistics and I love also adding the creativity to what we know, right. Then we have that foundation of who to market to. So I know that you are hyper local and hyper specific with your marketing. So can you one touch on um, your marketing and then two, you mentioned lifestyle. I know how involved you are in your community and you are just known for that. So can you give us kind of an example of what that looks like for people that yeah. haven't heard your story? So to, to pick up on your last point, um, you know, I moved back to Chicago five years ago and I had no database. Didn't really, I knew like a handful of people and I had to start over again from scratch. So um, growing up in small town, Iowa, um, I, I just have always known how to live in a small town. And what is a small town? Everybody knows each other. There's familiarity. Small businesses support each other. Um, and, you know, neighbors really lean on each other. But when I came to Chicago, that is not a thing. You have neighbors that live in high rises. There are single family homes. There's row homes. There's town homes. I mean, they, and they all have their own little lifestyle and amoeba and like mindset. And I knew that in order to have a business um, that I could thrive in, I had to put myself in the middle of that. Um, so what I did was I looked for, I mean, I, I lived in this neighborhood before, but it was it, when I left the first time it was gentrifying and turning over. And then when I came back to Chicago, um, I wanted to go back to that same neighborhood. because so I thought to myself, you know, there's, there's other parts of Chicago like Lincoln Park or the Gold Coast or Streeterville, very upscale high-end areas, but they're established. You know, they're, the people already know each other. It's very, um, very tight-knit. You know, this is an area that's developing, um, you know, very similar to parts of Florida, I'm sure. You know, they're, yeah. they're kind of stayed dormant for years and all of a sudden now they're coming to life. Well, that was where... I just liked the energy and the vibe. So I I wanted to be part of that growth. Um, And so what I did was I got involved with the neighborhood uh, block club um, association. So Chicago set up in ways that every half mile by half mile square in Chicago has a block club, which is basically like- That's crazy. Just repeat that again. So so Chicago really goes in like half mile long by half mile wide squares. Um, Chicago is a very- I mean, it's a grid system. So it's very much a very square city where, um, you know, our, our standard lot size, get ready for this. Our standard lot size in the city of Chicago is 25 feet wide by 125 feet deep. 
<laughs> that's a standard lot in, in Chicago. Oh my God. Um, I, I have a listing right now on a hundred foot lot and everyone's like, oh, it's just the, <laughs> the big deal. This is a big deal. Um, so <laughs> Lots of land. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, the land that this house sits on itself is worth a million dollars. So oh my gosh. Yeah, it's a big deal. Um, but anyway, I, I wanted to, in, of course, and you and I have talked about this before, but I grew up in an historic district and being around historic buildings and architecture and, and places just feels very home, homey to me. Um, so I wanted to get involved with, I got involved with historic preservation. I got involved with groups that um, you know, were just near and dear to me. Um, the best piece of advice I ever, so going back to why did I do that? The best piece of advice I ever got when I first got in the business, um, the number one agent my, in the Quad City office at the time, Deb Hausman, I, had, I sold nothing my first year in the business, by the way, uh, sold nothing. I was making copies of my license because I was getting ready to go hang it and at the board of realtors. And she's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting out of the business. And she's like, why? And I just said, because I haven't sold anything. I'm going broke. I think maybe <laughs> I need to finish. Because I was still selling real estate in, in college. And I just said, you know, maybe I just need to finish college. And I'll get back into it. She's like, what? Like, what are you? She's like, I see you lead generating. I see you doing activities. But like, what are you? She's like, what are you, what are you struggling with? I said, this whole networking thing just doesn't make sense to me. I'm getting networking. What is this? She's like, Alex, go make friends. <laughs> like oh oh and from that day forward it clicked so my mindset coming here was i just need to go make friends and i'm going to go make friends in areas that i care about doing in causes that i care about i'm just going to go be me and go make friends somewhere else um in those circles so that's what i did um so i got involved with the neighborhood association i got involved with the alderman's office because aldermans are like little mini mayors uh here in chicago so I, got, I was interested in development because there was a, it was an area that's rapidly growing. So I wanted to get involved with the development piece of it. Um, I just found the holes. I looked for area parts of the community that were broken or weren't working well. So one of the things that they wanted to do to bring in tourism and bring people into the neighborhood was architecture tours. And me growing up in theater and my nerdiness for architecture, I'm like, I can do architect architecture tours. So I started doing that. Um, now I chair that committee. So I just found different ways that um, to do it. And I don't know if you remember Brandy, but remember a couple of years ago, I used to do Mansion Mondays where every yes. Monday I did a, I did a, I featured a mansion. I talked about the history and the architecture of it. I got so much business from that. And I got so busy with the business. I never got back to doing it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So tell everyone though, what that was, because I know, yeah. but, and I follow you. And if you're not following him on social media, you definitely need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll put that um, in the chat later. So when I was getting started, I noticed that, you know, there was so much rich history and architecture and stories here in the community and people didn't know anything about it. Um, and I, and, you know, I, I'm a big believer, you know, the preservationist to me is that when people understand their connection to their community, they take better care of it. Um, so I started every Monday, I would do, I did a Facebook live video where I just, here's this house at 839 West Hutchinson. Here's the architect. Here's the, the original owner's story. Here's the house, you know, here's the architecture. And I got such a big following on that where people love learning about the stories and the histories that I was getting asked by other preservation groups to do tours of their neighborhoods. Wow. Um, and it basically, I, I was walking down the street one day in my neighborhood, just two blocks away. There's, there's a street called Hutchinson Street and there's you know, it's 78 single family homes that are a million, two million, five million plus. And I was walking down the street and I noticed all these houses that were for sale. I didn't have the listing on any of them, but they were sitting and not moving. And I, again, my creative challenge was how can I find a buyer for one of these houses? I don't have the listing, but I can find a buyer. So I reached out. So Landmarks Illinois is the biggest preservation group in the state of Illinois. Um, lots of very influential, very wealthy people in that group. Um, so I thought, and that was the thing is like, how do I find, how do I get a group of affluent people in to see these houses that will appreciate it? So I reached out to Landmarks Illinois and I said, Hey, can I organize an architecture tour for you? I'll organize the whole thing. You bring your highest donors because they're always looking for ways to get in front of their, their big donors. Of course. 
I'll organize an architecture tour of the houses that are for sale on the street. So I, uh, I reached out to all the listing agents. All of them said yes. Like, absolutely. Tell us when you want the house open. Free, we'll free press. Yeah. Totally free press and no work. All they had to do was show up and open the door. That was it. I was originally thinking this was going to be like a 10, 10 to 15 person group. Um, 46 people later, um, we had, and these were all people that donate in excess of $25,000 a year to oh. Lansing, Illinois. Um, highly affluent, highly influential. I invited the aldermen because putting the aldermen there in front of the people, that, that was a good thing. Because these are also, let me tell you who is in this group, architects, attorneys, developers, um, construction company executives. I mean, anybody in the building industry that was looking at investing in this neighborhood was there. Um, totally not what I thought it was going to be. So I had it catered and, um, you know, I called one of the neighbors that I knew and had befriended at the time and actually just sold their house two months ago. Um, I, I called, I was like, can I throw a party at your house? <laughs> He's like, yes, come on over. So we had it catered with a local restaurant, um, segue that into, I'm now on the board of directors for Landmarks, Illinois. Wow. Um, so there, so I, and that's, again, they, they showed, I, I showed up and I was authentic. I showed that I could fundraise. I showed that I could do all of that. And it's a cause I, I care a lot about. Um, but that was in it just spiral and snowballed. So, I mean, there's tons yeah. of people like, do you know this Alex Vulcan kid? He does, he's that nerd that does all the architecture stuff. And oh, by the way, he sells real estate. Um, and the result too is that someone that was on that tour had a good friend who was looking for a house that ended up buying one of the houses on the tour. They already had an agent, not me. Um, but the, the seller was a developer that, cause it had been gut rehabbed. The seller knew that buyer came from my tour and he listed his house with me. His oh my God, I love that story. So that, so he, and he never forgot that. Um, so that was, you know, there, it just, it, it, you know, I, I folk, basically to kind of summarize it. I picked an area. Um, I found the gaps and found ways that I could add my talents and skill set and just myself uh, to making a better place. And then I went and did it and, uh, and connected as many people and implemented and connected as, you know, my thing is I, I connect people to others who they would not have met without me such that by doing it, a community is created, built or improved. That's what drives me. And the, and real estate is just the, the, it, it's just the, um, the conduit by which yeah. the yeah. vehicle or conduit. I love that. So yeah. well put. So what I'm hearing is, you know, you wanted to farm an area that wasn't oversaturated with other yeah. agents. It was a little yeah. bit easier to infiltrate. You saw the potential with the historic preservation passion that other people had. That was very close to your heart. So it was very genuine for you to come across as that person who could connect everyone people felt it they didn't just see it so they felt the care so much that you end up getting a huge connection and and listing by connecting someone else to a listing agent i guarantee those bonds that you also have built with your competitors which a lot of times people don't understand the top agents in luxury they're all in the same circles and we're all supporting each other for the most part. It's just totally. a different way. And you did that yeah. in a very systematic way. So you didn't just come up with the creative part, right? The marketing and an idea. You actually had a great idea, took the necessary action steps and implemented it to the point where the relationships were built that will never probably be able to be broken. That's a yeah. phenomenal story. Well, and, and the other part too with that, Brandy, is, is I, another thing I, people always ask me, well, how can I get into luxury? How do I get started? You know, go for the low hanging fruit, like canceled and expireds and that sort of thing. But I specifically chose this area to your point about not an oversaturated market. I wanted to be in a, an emerging high-end luxury market. So really I picked an, an area, I picked an area that had a concentration of high-end homes that was in an unsophisticated area. I think that's the biggest issue that, that some agents have is they want to go be a luxury agent, some other part of a, a city or area. I'm like, take the path less traveled. And that was really what I did was I, I just decided I was going to be the number one agent in a, for high-end historical homes in an unsophisticated neighborhood. And to your point, you, you hit the point, you hit the nail on the head, which was, I actually have a listing coming in February 
that has been on the market for four years with another agent. She knows that I sell and do a lot of work in the area. She called me literally this morning um, and said, I can't take this listing another year. Um, can I refer it to you? Oh, yeah. And it's in my own neighborhood. And she's just, and cause I, here's the other thing too. The seller has asked her to reach out to me because I've shown that house four times. She hasn't. So, and so instead of her losing the listing, she's referring it to me um, and she'll get a referral fee from it. And this is a local agent. So this is, you know, the, that, that says a lot when you've built a, such a strong value proposition for yourself as, as in your, your area or in your farm area, people take note of that. Um, and, it, and they, they you, know, you become at that point, you become so many agents are dispensable. You become indispensable and invaluable. Yeah. And, and that's where when people see how you advocate for their community, they want you to advocate for them on their home sale. And that's a, I've learned, that was a lesson I learned that I didn't know uh, was going to be so valuable. I think, um, you know, that is a true testament to who you are as a professional when you can say that an, another agent in your area referred you a listing. So I want some of the agents on this call. People are getting disconnected on their iPhones, so I'm having to readmit them. So I just don't want you to think I'm not paying attention to you, Alex. I just want to make sure they're getting back on um, little connectivity issues. So I, I think think about that as an agent if you're on this call. Have you been referred a listing from your competitor in your same town? Like I think that's almost like a point in your career where you can go, wow, not only have I built bonds in my community by giving back and being you know, a part of it, but people that are my competitors see the value I bring to the community and they're okay with it. And they, they have an interest to help this seller so much that they're willing to say, why don't you take this over? I've done everything I can do. I think you're better suited for it based on X, Y, Z, and we can just work out a referral. Well, and here's another thing too that I discovered with this agent. I, I mean, I had one of the best professional conversations I've had this morning. Uh, I was on the phone with her for a little over an hour um, and she's an incumbent agent. You know, she's 70 years old and you know, she, she, she doesn't really sell in my neighborhood, but she sells in the neighboring adjacent neighborhood. Um, and she's been an incumbent agent over there. And she's just like, you know, I want to spend more time with my grandkids. I want to spend more time with my family and I don't really want to do this. So she's like, you know, I, I may have another one for you that I, she's like, it's been taking four years of my time. This is not how I want to spend my time. Right. <laughs> you know, now it's, it's a, it started a conversation of there's more to it than just this. So if there is an agent that, and you know, this is an agent that has a very, um, shall we say polarizing personality. I get along <laughs> great with this agent. But this is someone that it's like, you know, for them to refer a listing to me was, uh, it means the world to me. And this is a $3 million listing. Like it's wow. not just some little house, like it's a $3 million property. Um, so I mean that, don't underestimate the value of your own work, you know, the, that you do, because people will notice. I think they'll notice the passion and the care and the, the work that you put into it because you're not being a salesperson. You're, you're truly an advisor and you're the local economist of choice. Just like, you know, Gary says this, and I think it just kind of goes over our heads sometimes and they think, oh, just knowing your numbers or knowing your market, you have to know your community inside and out. And so when he says local economist of choice, he means, do you know everything about these neighborhoods, the people? the people, the lifestyle, you're sitting there naming off the developers, the contractors, you know what, who's given back, why they're given back, what they're passionate about, you know, everything about them. And so I love kind of that investigative part of it because of uh -huh. my psychology background. Like I want to be that FBI agent that's like, who are you and what are you about so I can better understand you so I can figure out how we can connect. And maybe if it's not me, connecting with you? How can I connect you with someone else that's going to help your family move forward and increase your net worth so you can give back more to the community? And, you know, another way I got started before I even, and actually one way that I knew that the tours were going to be a big deal, um, I used, it was the old bold that we used to have, the, the bold script of just doing a neighborhood survey. I went door to door, I called people and I just said, I'm a, I'm a, I sell real estate. 
Um, I just want to better understand this area. I'm not looking to take listings or solicit your business. I just have questions about the community. Do you have five to 10 minutes to meet on your front porch and just talk about this? I met with about 30 people, Wow, um, which was amazing to me because most people in Chicago, like, first of all, if there's a gate in front, no one wants to talk to you. Um, that was my belief. But then when I just told them what I was doing, I said, I just have quite, do you have five minutes to answer some questions on a survey I'm doing of the neighborhood? Not one person did I spend less than a half hour with. Yeah. Um, there were some days I would only talk to four people and it would take me six hours because everybody had a story. And that survey was, how long have you been here? Where'd you come from? Where would you go next? Um, what do you like about the neighborhood? What's something you wish you could change about the neighborhood? Um, and how can I help? And that conversation, those conversations changed everything. One of the things that came out of that survey um, was people not really knowing about the community, but they liked it. They liked that exclusive little enclave that they're in. Um, but one of the things that came out of it was there was one woman I met with who'd been, who moved in the neighborhood in 1965 wow. and she was 89 and she, I was on, I was on her front porch for an hour and a half and I loved it because she told me, she's like, I remembered when this area was dangerous in the seventies and eighties, it was a total murder crime spree. It was awful. Yeah. But then when it started to change in like the mid late nineties, the gates, people started putting up fences and gates. And she, she said something was so profound. She said, I feel like the gates divided us. And I said, oh. you that? she's like, I don't, she's like, I have neighbors who moved in two doors down from me 22 years ago. I don't even know their names. Wow. And, and I, I heard that over and over and over again. So here's the other thing I did. I, there was one woman um, who lives on the street. She's got this beautiful home. Um, she's on six city lots, massive, massive yard. Um, so I went to her, I called her because she was one of the people I interviewed. And I said, Vicki, I have an idea. What if we did a neighborhood block party just for everybody on the street because we got a couple people that moved in but I said I keep hearing this feedback over and over again she's like oh my god let's do it so there's 78 single family homes we set a date in September um, just like a cocktail party for everyone to come visit 78 single family homes 56 of them showed up wow that's a huge were, turnout for that were, and of course like I didn't live on the street everybody knew me from doing the survey so I worked the sign-in table of everybody I made like little pins for them to like have their addresses on it and so I met everybody that way and then I, I just you know mixed and mingled with them or whatever but it was so great and it fostered community I mean now then during the pandemic last summer um there was, everything was shut down in Chicago I was gonna say summer. what did you do I can't imagine you during the, the city kind of oh, shutting down with your personality so, fun. so I just decided it was like you know what screw it. You can't go to a restaurant, can't go to a bar, but all these houses in this neighborhood have are on double lots. They're on 50 foot wide lots. And I said, you know what? Everybody's got an outdoor space. Everyone's got a garage. Everyone's got a front porch. Everyone's got some sort of detail. What if I do something like a block tail party where everyone, so I just, I, I called you know, again, one of the neighbors and I just said, I have this idea because she's also very social like me. And I just said, she just redid, redid her backyard. And I said, Becca, what if we had a, a, a block party, like a cocktail, a block tail party? We'll just invite all the neighbors. Everyone can come in their masks, bring a BYOB. And yes. it's just, it's a little happy hour in the driveway and in your backyard, all outdoor for two hours, 5.30 to 7.30. Let's just do it on like a Friday. She's like, okay, yeah, sure. So um, we did that. 42 of the 78 single family homes oh. showed up. And because they were so just craving connections. So then I kept having a neighbor's kid coming up to me at this party. They're just like, we'll do one next Friday. Well, yeah, we'll take it Friday after that. And so from June 15th through the end of September, I, every single Friday, somebody hosted it. And then wow. we did it again this summer because people liked it so much. So um, it became a tradition out of tradition. the pandemic. Absolutely. And all, so you know, people ask, well, how'd you do it? Did you do like paperless post? It was very simple. It was uh, Microsoft Excel. I had everyone's email addresses that I got from doing that survey. Um, and then as new people moved in, it, what's funny is as new people moved into the neighborhood, all, the neighbors all like, do you know Alex Walking? You need to get on his email list. Um, <laughs> and the other thing too, is I, at the beginning of the pandemic and everything shut down, like I knew there's people that had kids that go to school or private school. 
And I was talking to one of the neighbors because um, they're asking, well, how does this affect real estate values? And he's a commercial realtor. And I just said, you know, we don't know yet. It's going to really stink. Um, but he's like, well, I got my kids that are, you know, we're, we're tutoring, you know, we're trying to get a tutor to just keep them on track. And I was like, well, you know, um, uh, Larry and Melissa next door to you, I think they have a tutor too. Aren't your kids the same age? Oh, I didn't know we could do that. So this is what I did. I just was like, you know what? Everybody needs to stay connected now more than ever. I sent out an email to the whole email list and I just said, I have a, so I have a database. We all call it a database. Right. I looked at that list of 78 single family homes and I thought to myself, I don't have a database. I have a roster. Um, <laughs> so I, I, um, so I, I, I sent an email out. I just said, I have everyone's contact info. If you're okay with it, I'll share this list with just everyone in this group. Everyone commented back and said, yes, please do it. So I made it look pretty and I put a neighborhood roster together and sent that out. And like people worshiped the ground I walked on because I sent them an Excel sheet. Like they, they were just so appreciative. Now there's people that like their kids walk to school, they shared tutors together, or some of them, you know, went to another neighbor's house and they had to take an important call or something because these neighbors were out traveling to Wisconsin or whatever. So it, it, they're, the neighbors are now coming to me for connection and they, they come to me because like, do you have this person's phone number? So now I'm the center of that. Yeah, um, you're the I'm resource. The, for I'm, the, the, I'm, the, I'm the gatekeeper, you know, yeah. is, is what it is. They come to me. And also because it's a landmark street, they come to me everything like, do you have an architect for this? Do you have a contractor for this? Or do you have to, I have to get this approved. Oh yeah, I'll connect you to this person. They'll get you through the you know Historic Preservation Commission to get your porch approved next week. So now that's become invaluable. It's like, oh God. So, and all I'm doing is connecting people. I'm not- And you, and you moved here and didn't know anyone. Didn't know and anyone. you just decided this is the area I'm going to focus on. And, and like you said, the one community you didn't even live in. So, yeah. you know, I think people get this uh, misconception that they must live in the neighborhood that they want to sell in. Um, and, you know, for, for my team, we kind of sell in different places because different team members want to focus on different areas. And I think that's also OK, you know, to have those team members. So let me ask you, obviously, this has been a tremendous success for you. You're, you're 30 under 30 on National Association of Realtors. Everyone knows you in the luxury division. I can't mention your area without someone stating your name and you know that we have a lot of mutual friends from many different panels yeah. and and zoom calls and masterminds so what is going to happen next in your world what's next for you um i need to find a new director of ops because mine is transitioning to a buyer's agent and he'll kill it um <laughs> so i need to you mean know. talent wants to grow in your organization <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, that's the, the big thing for me right now is I, I discovered as I built my business out in my area, um, there are other areas neighboring mine that are in need of my help. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I've kind of hit my ceiling and my limit here in this neighborhood. So just expanding what I do to other areas just a mile west of me and just a mile north of me. Um, that's the big thing we're, we're working on now. And the way we're doing that is a little bit different. Um, I have a, a million dollar market report that's going out. So it's a 16 page full, um, you know, very comprehensive analysis of the market north of a million dollars north of Irving Park Road here in the city. Um, so that's been a, cause what's, what I found, uh, in my neighborhood, because I sent out a monthly, uh, market report, just a two pager, um, a lot of people on the street are very well connected and they know people I've been getting asked if I could send them stats in other neighborhoods. So oh. instead of, cause not everyone's sending out just listed, just sold. Oh, look at me. I'm a realtor. No one cares. But when you <laughs> see the actual like stats and data and graphs, People gravitate to that, especially in the luxury field, as, as you know. I mean, people look at their houses as an asset and their Absolutely. portfolio. And when they can, like, okay, yeah, 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 this person's got all pretty pictures and Instagram posts. Let's talk to the person with actual real data and actually knows the market and can, because you know, here's the thing they, they, they're always looking at 
Fox News, CNN, MSNBC money, like they're always tracking their money in the stock market. There is no TV show talking about the real estate market. There's all these shows of like, you know, million dollar listing, all the drama, but no one's actually talking about the stats. Um, so that's what those people in that market are after. So I, I decided to take it upon myself to build this market report out, to send it to those neighboring communities. And we just dropped it in the mail yesterday. So I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think um, it's so funny because it, it's so rudimentary to really think about how to be successful, whether it's in luxury or any price point. Um, I think if you can master being learning based and always being a student and knowing something before someone else does, especially when it comes to the statistics, it was so funny. Um, I had recruited attracted an agent from Sotheby's and he came on my team and now he's building his own team in my market center, which is really cool. Two years later. Cause he's like, I don't know how to do this. Why don't I just work on your team and then I can do it. I'm like, awesome. So he was, he said, it's funny. He goes, don't repeat this, but I was talking to the president of the board of realtors. Who's also a good friend of mine. He used to come to my MREA book club before uh -huh. I even had a market center. He would come and sit, he ended up starting his own brokerage, but he says to this other gentleman, Oh, you're going to go work with Brandy and learn how to build a team. He goes, she's a real estate savant. And I was like, no, I just study the market. Like we, we, we make it so complicated that there's so much to learn and it's very simplistic. And I hear this all the time. I'm not a numbers person or I'm afraid of numbers. It, all this information is actually done for you. If all you've got to do is research it and just internalize it. But a lot of it is done for you. We're so spoiled in today's market with the resources. Well, and not only that, but so to your point, and anybody who's listening that has a fear of numbers, um, here's what I tell you, the, the numbers tell a story of mm -hmm. supply and demand. That's all they tell you. And it's your job to communicate that story and mm -hmm. tell that story like you're at story time in a kindergarten class. Yep. That's all you need to do. That is your secret sauce. You break it down for people and help them understand what does this, what do these numbers mean? Yep. And that's what people gravitate to you for. And here's the thing, it sounds silly. It sounds so simple that a monkey could do it and yet no one's doing it. Instead, yeah. what you're seeing is your social media feeds clogged with this BS of sitting at my open house, 12 to two, <laughs> young listed. No, oh, multiple offers, 25 offers in 48 hours on the market. Okay, you and everyone else, you're not special. Yeah, this like, isn't genius are, right now to sell it list. <laughs> yeah. the, I, the best thing you heard is talk less, say more. Mm. I love it. I, I, think that's a, I think that's a great way to set yourself apart in the luxury market. And, and you I have love to be what where, you said about telling a story because like I said, yeah. I think people get caught up in the numbers and they just get so overwhelmed and stressed about that. And really it's just look deeper than that. It, the story is right there. It's just all in how you're conveying your message to the people that want to understand what's going on. And that's our job as an expert. That's literally our job. That's exactly the, you know, tell people what you know, and then that's what they're really looking for. And that I can't tell you how many times, you know, high-end sellers have called me or I've, they've seen me around because I'm always going in my neighborhood. I'm always going to the coffee shop. I'm always having dinner. I mean, the I, I joke when you've heard me say this on panels before, it's like, you're never going to catch me in a $2 million listing wearing a blue suit and brown shoes because the all these people know me. They I'm in Lululemon today. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm getting ready to go have lunch across the street after this. And like, if I show up, I, I'll never forget this. I just this past summer, I went to go with a listing appointment. It was probably one, three, one, four is what they're going to list at. I was wearing dress pants because I came from an open house. <laughs> I'll never forget this. I opened the door and they're just like, What are you wearing? You, they're like, Aren't you a little overdressed? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. you know, that's another thing too, is I, I really leaned into what my style was. I really leaned into who I am because I'm not going to wear, you know, sweatpants to a listing appointment, but people know that my style is, is casual and polished yet approachable. And I think that so many people want to get into the high end real estate market thinking they have to wear a suit and heels and drive a nice car. It's like, no, go be an expert and be a professional. People don't care about what you know until they know how much you care.
Absolutely. And that's the, the, that's the, the biggest thing I think that I took away from that was my greatest weapon was I was not afraid to be myself. And that, and that resonates with people. And when, when you're comfortable with being yourself and you're comfortable in your, your data, your statistics or how you've prepared for the listing, it puts them at ease and it, they instantly feel like they can trust you. Um, and you're not putting on a show. You know, that, yeah. that's the other they, thing. they don't want to show every other agents oh. come in there and, and talked about how great they are and what yeah. kind of, you know, My, I was just competing for a listing and I got it um, just up that way. And, um, you know, I was, I was one of five agents they were interviewing and the, um, in the seller, it was through a trust. I don't even know the sellers, but I just said, I asked, I was like, so I was like, to you know, why did you pick me over the other agents? Sure. And he just, he said, I felt like I could trust you and you weren't, he's like, you, you didn't blow a bunch of <laughs> His words, not mine. You didn't blow a bunch of smoke up my ass with open houses, marketing packets, and all this other shit. You actually got down to business. I was like, all right, well, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your response. I will put that in my notepad. Okay, so it's 1242. We usually open it up to Q&A if you have a little bit more time, oh, Alex. Is that okay? Absolutely. That works. Um, I do want you before we open it up, though, and please put any questions in the chat if you're if you're not wanting to come off mute. But please, you know, this is your time to get as much as you can from him. Can you just show everyone the view you showed me earlier of oh, yeah. where you live? Uh, actually, it's a little brighter outside now. So uh, I was blown away by this, and I live like near the Gulf of Mexico. So I was blown away it, by this. It kind of looks like the ocean, but. So this wow. is all Lake Michigan. So this is Montrose Harbor, where the bird sanctuary is, and and the uh, uh, the nice uh, boat harbor, anyway. But then this is my. So this is all Lake Michigan over here. Wow. Yeah. So that's my view. That's what I get to see every day. Not, not a bad place to you know make some phone calls and connect. <laughs> no, not at all. And that's uh, it's kind of nice. <laughs> That's a that's the fringe benefit, right, of selling luxury real estate. That's right. <laughs> that's right. It all works out. Okay, so um, does anyone have any questions for Alex while we have him? I know Allie does in our questions. Okay, um, do you want to come up here and ask yeah. him? I'm gonna since she's in the training room with me. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna have. So Allie's newly licensed in Florida. She's gonna be again moving to your area. So she's yeah. she's been taking notes and thank thank goodness because I'm not because I'm hosting. So I'm gonna have to use her notes. <laughs> come on up, Allie. Ask as many questions as you want, and then again, if come off mute if you have okay. a question. Okay, so first, I the first question I had is, what area did you were you talking about that you were in? Um, I'm in, I'm in right around. Yes, I'm in uh, uptown, specifically the Buena Park uh, quarter of, of uptown. Just okay. you know where Wrigley Field is. Um, yeah. So my neighborhood borders Wrigley Field. Okay, I'm about to get ready to be in River North. Um, oh, yeah. so that's that's only really the area that I know because my sister lives there. Um, sure. But that's where I'm going to be. And then what were you, what areas were you talking about that you were going to kind of move to? So further north. So like uh, Ravenswood, Lincoln Square, Andersonville, Edgewater, that little basically Irving Park to like Devon um, and then over to like Damon Avenue. OK, mm -hmm. um, another question I have. This might be like specific to me. Not everyone might be interested, but like what would you say because you're in luxury? What would you say is like the biggest difference between doing luxury and not luxury? What do you recommend if you're starting in the business that would you say is like the biggest difference between the two and yeah. just your, your peace of mind? You know, I really think the, the difference that I find with luxury, um, luxury buyers anyway, is they don't look at very many properties. They usually know the market just as well as we do, if not better. Um, and you really need to be able to speak the language. So the best thing you can do, and, and the, my advice to anybody who wants to grow their price point and grow into a higher price bracket, go learn the market. Go to every broker's open. Go to every public open house. I mean, the first three months that I moved here in 2016, I, I did nothing but go to open houses. I just wanted to learn the inventory um, and do open houses. I, I mean, one of my my first, actually my very first million dollar sale 
came from an open house. They came into the open and they, that was the place they wanted. We were in multiples and I, I won and then I got their listing. Um, but that was, you know, the, the best thing you have as a newer agent is time. Um, and that, that is a huge advantage. And the biggest thing I find with luxury buyers is they often go right to the property they want. Um, generally speaking, it's not their first time buying a property. They bought and sold many homes many times. Um, and usually they know exactly what they're looking for. And when it comes on the market, they will go look at it. Another thing that luxury buyers will do is they will go look at it and they will sit. Um, and they will wait and they'll wait for that price to drop because they know they, to them, they know what it's worth and you have to be able to communicate what the value is. Um, the other thing too, is your ability to negotiate. You know, they are, um, you know, a lot of these people are executives or business owners. They want to know that you can hold your, you can hold your own in a negotiation. You're not going to get blown away. Um, you know, that's the, a really big thing. Um, the, the, I will say one of the things that, um, I've really had to refine and work on because I got in at such a young age was refining my negotiation skills. Some of it was practice. Some of it was time. Some of it was, you know, getting the CNE designation. But my, my favorite thing is, um, I, I got a listing earlier this summer. It was 1.2, um, and the, he, he, uh, they hired me because they knew that in a negotiation, I dig my heels in. And then we sold their house. That's exactly what I did. I dug my heels in and drew the line in the sand, and, uh, but also knew how to get the other party to, to sway our way, too. So it's all communication. Dale Carnegie is a great training course for that. Um, I would say my negotiation skills changed drastically when I, when I took that class. Okay. Um, so that, that's another thing, too. And that's something that they just expect, is that you know okay. how to do that. Okay. I'll definitely keep that in mind. And I might ask Brandy for your yeah. information to, to connect with you because I don't want to take up everyone's time, but thank you so much. That was amazing. And of so, much, so much to offer. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think for us, we're able to represent buyers as a single agent. So the first thing I did was get my ABR and yeah. we went from a heavy, heavy seller market where I had my, my first listing in 2004 was like 600,000, which was way above yeah. what I ever expected. Um, now it's just the average price. Um, but then it shifted to a heavy buyer's market. So I had to learn how to negotiate. And then there was a lot of luxury stuff that was short sell and foreclosure. So I had to learn that process with negotiating yeah. with a negotiator for the bank. <laughs> So they do this for a living um, or I had to negotiate with their attorneys. So I think you're spot on saying that that's a great designation. There's also great negotiation books out there. Um, you Never split the difference. That's a good yeah. one. That's yeah. a great one I was going to mention. And then Dale Carnegie is how to uh, win and influence. Win friends. Yeah, how to win friends, friends and influence people. There's yep. a book, but I actually took the training course that teaches yeah. that book. Um, and that was money well spent money well spent and all it is is communication and that's really all this business is just communication uh, high level communication high 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 and that's what they you know i think the biggest thing i've noticed with luxury clients is that they expect a very high level of communication and um you know if you can communicate with a luxury client at a high level the first time home buyers and the move up clients like that's easy you know, yeah that, that's you know so i see so many agents struggle with that i'm just like you know, all you have to do is this and that and change this and write that and then call this person and tell them this. That's it. You can figure that out. And that yeah, comes yeah. from the experience of working on very highly nuanced transactions like a luxury listing or a buyer. Those are highly nuanced. If you can I get through that. Yeah. I feel like you um, spoke about something that's very important is a lot of luxury buyers, they've been CEOs or high level business people. So, you know, these business minded conversations that we're very accustomed to having at Keller Williams are very applicable when you're on an appointment. I mean, a lot of times when I'm talking about marketing, I mention things that have to do with either the luxury division, um, obviously our numbers, those are very clear how much luxury we sell. That's a great story, but also just talking about how, you know, our technology is. I mean, some people don't know that we're partners with Facebook and Google. If somebody's yeah. owned a large company and you bring that into the conversation, they kind of look at you and say, well, wait a minute, your real estate company is partnered with Google and Facebook. They don't know this. 
And so that might be an internal thing that we are, you know, having conversations with in our market centers, but I think it's relevant when you go to list property. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, and what I, what I tell client, you know, a lot of newer agents too, when they get into luxury is I, I just tell them, go learn how to sell real estate first, go learn how to sell the first time home buyers and the, and you know, the, the entry level stuff. Cause that's typically where the hardest transactions are. If you can get through a title issue or an inspection issue on a $200,000 house, the luxury stuff is easier. You'll mm-hmm. build your, a great way to build your confidence and start with the, start with, you know, the, the entry level business first. And that's what's made me a, a great agent is that experience. And then what happens is another way into luxury is those clients grow up with you. You know, the, those, those, those clients will buy and sell and they buy the 200, they sell it for 250, they buy it 400, sell it 500 and they buy a million. I mean, that's, that's, um, that's the next phase that I'm seeing my business go is all those people that bought their first homes with me three to five years ago and have been promoted three and four times since you know, they're getting ready to sell their three and four hundred thousand dollar condos and they're getting ready to go buy eight hundred, nine hundred, one, two, one, five houses with me. So yeah. and it's all and we and- we have so many people sitting on so much equity right now. So whether oh they're God. you know pulling Absolutely. money out or selling, I mean the I mean, Allie knows like all she's been doing is working on my database because there's so much opportunity. And when you get to a certain level, you have to have help kind of working the communication, but it's in a specific way that you have to communicate with them to help them understand, like, is this a good time for yeah. you to use that equity? But it's so rewarding to see them step up, especially, you know, in 2006 or 2008, when I helped them buy a short sell and get this killer deal in Florida. And now they can sell that home and buy this luxury home. It's a really cool feeling. It's a very cool feeling. It's a cool, like I just, I, I tomorrow I have a closing for 800,000 and I, these people, like I had this little condo. I loved them. They were sweet. I sold this place, multiple offers on it and didn't think anything of it. And they were going to rent, they were going to move out of the area. And then they called me and they said, Hey, well, we, um, you, we decided that we're going to stay in the area. We found this house. We want to go look at, we would love for you to represent us. I was like, Oh, sure. Okay. And I didn't think anything of it. I pulled up the listing. It was just listed eight ninety nine nine. I was like, did not see that one coming. So <laughs> here you go. And they sold this little three hundred thousand dollar condo with me. I thought nothing of it, but I was just doing my job and treating really treating your luxury, treating all your clients like you treat your luxury clients. And yeah, I love that you say that because I mentioned I had the conversation with Mo Anderson one time of you know, I I don't look at these different price points. I mean, I did a $50,000 short sell for a gentleman who got put in this terrible loan as a first time home buyer. And then he referred his girlfriend to me for 250. By the time I had sold his family and her family properties, it all added up to about $3 million in less than two years of sales. And they're consistently referring me their boss and other people's properties. I mean, I just got a referral from the owner of a pest control company I've used for years. They used to help me with my open houses when I was a brand new agent and I didn't know what I was doing. And now, you know, a gentleman's retired and wants, they could choose hundreds of agents. And so it's just a cool feeling that it's like you service so many top agents and the owner of the company is like, no, you have to call this agent. So that's where I'm going later. And I, I had to say I'm in leggings today because I'm teaching, but he's like, no, I just need you to tell me what to repair in my house. I'm like, we have a repair and remodel company. We'll help you. So it's just, it's crazy how the connections, like you talked about earlier, lead to these opportunities. And staying in touch with them too. I mean, I think that's another big opportunity that people don't do and, and telling people that you service uh, a phrase that I've started using is condos to castles, big or small, I sell them all. <laughs> it, not anything special, but um, it, uh, Rana Williams in New York City, she just had an amazing story with that. She helped this guy and like when she first got in the business in like 83, it's like 30 some years ago, 38 years ago, she was helping this guy. He was, it was like in the eighties, like, you know, economic crisis and yeah. he had this little one bedroom condo. He was uh, in his twenties at the time. Um, she listed his condo in the, everyone hated the floors. This guy had no money. So she actually paid to have the floors refinished. Wow. Um, and he said, Rana, I will pay you back someday. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I'm going to pay you back. And so he, and this, he had started this little, this little company. 
um, and uh, this little financial planning company because everybody was you know broke at the time. But he was he had an accounting degree. Um, it was a little company called Merrill Lynch. Oh, and he was so. She always stayed in touch with them, and um, as that company continued to grow, um, she got a call uh, January, no, December of 2019. Remember, I was on a panel with her at family reunion in Dallas. Um, he got a, she got a call from a number she didn't recognize, and he it was him, and she said, and he said, uh, Rana, I told you I was going to pay you back, and I want you to represent me. I've already found a place I want. I just need you to help me buy it. She said, okay. It was $27 million. Oh my God. It was her biggest sale she's ever had. And that was it's 27 and a half million. And now that was a similar thing. It just, you know, she always stayed in touch and just, you know, kind of rode the wave with him. And, she, and he referred her a ton of business over the years, but that was kind of the, the cherry on top. Was, and that was 38 years later. <laughs> Can you imagine getting that call? I mean, just for doing Great the right story. thing. I mean, I, I yeah. have to do the right thing and the money will always come, right? That's right. That's right. So we have a few minutes left. Um, I just want to be mindful of everyone's time, including the uh, guests on here. So we have about three minutes left. Does anyone have any questions you'd like to ask Alex before we go? You're all being so shy. Let's see, we've got a little chat here. Hi so, there, hi. Uh, my name okay. is Claire and I'm in the St. Augustine Market Center. How are you guys? Hi. Good, how are you? I'm good, thanks. I, I just started typing because you guys were chit-chatting and I kind of wanted to get my thoughts out. Um, sure. So I've got this brand new listing. I'm gonna post the link to it. It's the biggest of my career, um, 3.6. It's on um, kind of the peninsula that overlooks the Ocean Inlet, Matanzas Bay, the intracoastal historic St. Augustine. And I've got my ad ready for Haven's Lifestyle. I'm waiting for KW Luxury to come up with a proof to send me. And of course, it's already been blasted to Wall Street Journal, Barron's and Mansion Global, and on the Facebook Luxury Group. Where else and what else can I do for additional exposure? So if you send it to KW Luxury, you can also get it on their Instagram, which is good. Um, and obviously I'm sure you have a great video of it. The other um, option is sending it to top agents and feeder markets for St. Augustine. I love St. Augustine, by the way. That's my second favorite city in Florida outside of Sarasota where I'm <laughs> from. Um, but send it to, and, and I'm, I'm happy to put it in my newsletter. A lot of times agents will feature your listings on their websites and newsletters because they have a huge database. And of course, it's more interesting when you have a newsletter or something on the website that's outside of your local area. Plus it shows how global we are, that we are connected sure. even though we're the largest company. Yeah. All right, Alex? so KW Luxury, and they'll put it on Instagram and then just go through and find the top agents in KW. And your feeder market. Yeah. So yeah. one of the things that I usually do um, when I take a new listing like that when the photos look incredible. Um, the, look the one of the things video. that, um, <laughs> one of the things that I usually do is I build like a buyer profile. And then usually it's just I'll, me and my yellow notepad and like, who is the most likely buyer for this property? Where do they hang out at? What kind of clothes do they wear? What kind of car do they drive? You know, just really getting into the visualizing who it was. And sometimes the best, the best source for who your most likely buyer is, look at who your sellers were when they bought that house. Um, yeah, so we totally had that conversation. Yeah. Um, this woman has owned it for more than 40 years. Yeah. When wow. she and her husband bought it, it was just she and he, their kids were already grown and out of the house. So mm. we've had that conversation. We also think that, you know, somebody kitschy who likes the black marble bathtub and, you know, the black and white checkerboard floors and kind of the nod to the nostalgia of 80s architecture yeah. and the amazing millwork. And, so, you the, know. The, the question that I, where I was going with that is the, there's two things there, which is, who's the most likely buyer and where can you find them? And then the second thing is, um, where is the value in the house? Because I, like I, I mentioned earlier, I have a new listing where it's on a hundred foot wide lot. Um, yeah. And the, the value there is in the land. So exactly. we, um, 
you know, I, I started shopping it around to developers, you know, somebody like, you know, it's not a teardown candidate, but it is a, a rehab candidate. Um, and in that particular case, you know, with you're talking about, you know, maybe somebody with young kids or uh, somebody that just enjoys that. Um, I've always been a big fan of events of getting people in the door and partnering with nonprofits where people like that will hang out. So is it, you know, organizing some sort of cocktail party for the local school or a, or a private school that a lot of those people in the neighborhood send their kids to? Is it a, um, I see it's on the water. Is there a, is there a boating club or a yacht club um, nearby that you can have a private open house for of just members of that club? And then have a, you know, somebody, there was a house that just sold up um, in the North shore that had, a, a, and I had one of the few houses that has a dock and they had a, they partnered with the local yacht club. They, he had a boat dealer that came in and brought in like this new yacht that they were um, marketing. So he had them invite their database to the open house. Had, it was a, it was like a six or $7 million property. And yeah. they, um, they, you know, they, they, it was one of the people that was one of the customers of this boat dealer ended up buying the house. Um, so I mean, there was, you know, there's ways that, you know, use the, use the, wherever the value is in the house, use that to help guide who you can partner with and leverage their databases to come into the property. That's, That's a, great yeah, yeah, events, yeah, events um, are a great thing. Events are a great way to get people in the door and get yeah, people. Yeah, I love tying it to a nonprofit is yeah. a great idea. Um, we have, I'm the chair for the Raise Them Charitable Foundation and all the approved charities are usually tied to home ownership or we do have some food banks and things like that. But whatever your heart is close to is always wise because then you're going to be so aligned with the people that come to the event and it'll be so much easier. Like Alex is so genuine with his people because he's passionate about what they care about. So, you know, obviously we want to be around the most affluent, but there might be a charitable foundation where it's just not something you're as passionate about and it's going to be difficult to connect with them. So definitely figure out what's close to your heart. It just may, it comes across more genuine. Yeah. Well, and I think the seller is also involved in a lot of foundations as well. Yeah. She's at Perfect. that point in her life where obviously she doesn't work. She's 81 years old and um, that's what she does as, as her job and to, and to stay busy. So I think yeah. that's a great idea. Perfect. Well, thank you. It wouldn't surprise me if the buyer for that house is someone that seller already knows. Yeah. And they, well, they, they're it, running very tight circles. She's had it listed previously throughout the mm -hmm. years. And the problem yeah. is it's, it's truly a two bedroom, but non-conforming three mm -hmm. uh, and 7,153 square feet. I mean, it's, it's a, a very heavily nuanced property. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> so it is either an older couple whose kids have flown the coop or um, as part of that buyer profile. But you, you guys have given me a lot of food for thought and I really appreciate the time. Just, um, we can maybe connect later in essence of time, but sometimes those non-conforming spaces in Florida are actually grandfathered in depending on the year in which the home was built. And since they've been there for a long time, you can always get with your county, city, or municipality and figure out if that non-conforming has been grandfathered in where you can actually resell it as living area square footage. So we can chat about that later if you have questions or maybe you've already looked into it. Well, and it's really, sorry, it's really just the third bedroom and I've got mm -hmm. it on the floor plan. It's really easy to convert that to make it a true three. Um, but yeah, if either of you guys want to share this, there's an awesome drone video on there too. <laughs> and right. I got I'd love the help. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your help and time. Of course. of course. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So, Alex, you've been wonderful. I know Ali has lots of notes for me. Thankfully, she's here visiting, and hopefully I can connect the two of you. Maybe she can be your shadow one day to learn from you. Of course. I would love that. Thanks for having <laughs> me. It's been fun. All right. Well, good to see you and we'll chat soon. Sounds great. Thanks, guys. Have a great day, everyone.